am Sean Arrington. I am chairing this first session I'm from Arise and the Labour Assembly Against Austerity. And I am really pleased to welcome you to the start of this day long event, Socialist Solutions to the Crisis. Um, this opening session is called No to Tory Class Warfare for an Economy that Delivers for People and the Planet. Um, and we have some really, really great speakers to start the day and get us kicked off. Um, the whole event today is hosted by Arise, a festival of Labour's left ideas, and hopefully many of you will have seen previous events that we've done. Um, but today brings together a range of left organisations, campaigns and publications. Um, and this is actually the first of five sessions across the day. Um, don't worry, we're going to be having breaks uh, between them all. Um, and so you can just like uh, bob in and out or have us on the background as you do other things in the sun. But we really hope you join us for the whole day. And the five sessions because they're all great. Um, we're really delighted to have such great speakers and campaigners join us for this first session and to really bring people together for this discussion on how the Conservatives are carrying forward their decade of austerity and cuts. Um, actions that were designed to benefit the richest then and of course we've also seen the restructuring of our economy even more towards the interests of the 1% during the Covid pandemic, um, a pandemic which they've handled uh, incredibly badly and with such fatal and tragic results. Um, um, I think we can really see and feel this reality around us each day. We've seen the running down and privatisation of our public services, um, real pay cuts across the economy. So after a lost decade of wages for millions of people after the financial crash in 2008, last year half of all workers experienced a real wage cut and of course, for public sector workers, including the NHS, the government have been clear that real pay cuts will continue. Um, we've seen the increase in unemployment with many more job losses to come unless further action is taken. And also a further increase in insecure work um, by letting practices such as fire and rehire rip um, on top of the sharp rise in insecure employment that we had already seen over the past decade. Um, we also know that women, black and Asian ethnic minority and disabled people People have been the hardest hit by both austerity and the pandemic and will face further attacks in the Tory assault on rights, jobs and living standards to come. Um, and it's been really clear, I think, if any clarity was needed, that the Tories don't have the ambitious policies needed to address the climate emergency. Any action they do take is insufficient and designed to look after the wealthiest first. Um, but there is an alternative, and that's really what we're going to be discussing today. Polling again and again shows the popularity of socialist policies to address the crisis, such as expanding public ownership, a massive programme of investment um, for decent public transport, public services and housing, to mention in just some aspects of a Green New Deal and substantial increases in public sector pay and the minimum wage. So now is the time for Labour to put forward a radical vision of the future, including the bold policies we've just develop for massive public investment for this transition and to decarbonise our economy. And that's some of the aspects we're going to touch on in this session in particular and also throughout the day. Um, as the session goes on, uh, please do post questions in the comments below the stream on YouTube and in the question and answer section on Zoom. And we're going to be putting some to our panel. And um, there's going to be short breaks between sessions, as I mentioned earlier, and a slightly longer lunch break um, after the second session. Um, as I mentioned earlier, if you're on Zoom or YouTube, you can stay on throughout the day, just on the same link. Uh, just leave it playing while you bob off and make a cup of tea and some lunch. Um, and please also uh, donate at the link provided so Arise can continue hosting these important events um, and support other campaigns and links that we're going to be putting in the chat throughout the event. So you can link up with the campaigners that we're featuring in today's event. Um, so I'm going to hand over to our speakers um, they're going to all introduce they're going to have about uh, nine, ten minutes each, and then we're going to do rounds of questions um, that you've put to them. So first of all, I'm going to hand over to Ben Shacko, um, who's the editor of The Morning Star. Um, the Morning Star is one of Arise's media partners, and we're really delighted to work with them again today, and we're always pleased to have Ben on a panel. So, Ben. Thanks very much, Sean. Um, I'm just thinking it's... it's um, Quite appropriate that we're we're holding this conference today as the the world's richest countries are meeting in in Cornwall, 
uh, supposedly putting the world to rights. The theme of this session is no to Tory class warfare for an economy that delivers for people and planet. Um, if we were to believe everything that we're hearing from Cornwall in the last few days, then we're, there's no point in this meeting at all because Boris Johnson has that under control. Uh, this morning he was talking about how important it was that we don't repeat the mistakes of the last crisis, the big economic recession of 2008, when the recovery was not uniform across all parts of society. Not mentioning why that might have been, the fact that it was his party that um, enacted the devastating austerity measures that made Britain so much more unequal and in fact undermined our ability to cope with the pandemic when it struck by um, part privatising public services and in various other ways which we can look at. But this hypocrisy from Boris Johnson is not um, unusual. In fact, he's been um, coming out with a lot of this sort of stuff this week. Um, yesterday, he was saying that he was um, behind a vision for a cleaner, greener world, a solution to the problems of climate change. He wanted to generate many, many millions of high-wage, high-skilled jobs. Um, possibly the most hypocritical thing he'd said for almost 24 hours, because on Thursday, he claimed that his government had led the way in efforts to protect humanity from coronavirus. That was just one day after Britain was one of only four voices at the World Trade Organization which shot down plans for a waiver on vaccine patents that would have allowed developing countries to produce them. Britain is actively preventing poorer countries in the world from producing vaccines. So that's how much commitment um, the Tories have to protecting humanity from coronavirus. We know in fact, of course, they haven't even led efforts to protect this country's people, let alone humanity. Um, that's why with 150,000 dead, Britain has one of the worst uh, experiences of coronavirus anywhere in the world. We know that the Tories are not investing in green technology. They're not levelling up, as Boris keeps uh, saying that they are. We're seeing a changing strategy from various uh, governments around the world. You know, the Biden government in the United States, I'm not a fan of it. I think it's pursuing a dangerous, aggressive foreign policy. But it is investing in science and research. It is upgrading infrastructure across the US. It is upgrading public services and trying to invest in better paid jobs. I think they're doing it because they want to compete with the Chinese rather than for any more sort of uh, altruistic motives. But they are doing it. None of that's true of the Conservatives over here. What commitments we do see to public services are basically fraudulent. So there was a lot of hot air about rail renationalisation, the abandonment of the franchise model and the introduction of Great British Railways. But Great British Railways is not a nationalised railway. It's just a framework to compensate for private sector incompetence while continuing to guarantee profits for private investors. And health privatisation is likewise masked by the umbrella of the NHS as a kind of publicly owned trusted brand, even while the NHS itself is infiltrated by and increasingly dependent on profiteering private contractors. And through the pandemic, we've seen an acceleration of health service privatisation, even though, of course, we've seen in the, the contrast between the absolute shambles of the privatised outsourced test and trace programme and the extremely effective, in fact, genuinely one of the most effective in the world vaccine rollout, which is led by the publicly owned NHS. We've seen how much better public services are throughout the pandemic, but that's not um, a lesson which the Conservatives look to be learning. We're also aware that despite all the idealism of the early part of the pandemic, all that clap for carers stuff, the feeling that lots of people were talking about this time last year, that we had learned who the real key workers were, we found that they were shockingly badly paid, struggling along in insecure work. Nothing has changed there either, except that the race to the bottom is picking up speed. Um, just as the evidence all around us that, you know, Prince Charles is hosting a soiree tonight for G7 leaders and the heads of the world's largest companies, and they're going to talk about how to fix climate change. But we know that the solutions to the environmental crisis are not going to come from big business or politicians because the system, the profit driven system is driving us over a cliff. And we're seeing the same thing with this talk of leveling up. Um, we know that the many of the problems of the pandemic are caused by an insecure workforce. That was why people couldn't afford to isolate. That's why. Um, the virus was so able to spread so uncontrolled in uh, this, this country. But the fire and rehire drive across large sectors of the economy shows that everything is getting worse. Employers are downgrading workers' pay and conditions on pain of getting the sack. And labour market logic means that the mass unemployment created by the pandemic will drive down wages as well. So I think that as a movement, we need to keep up a relentless focus on these issues like pay. The majority of people in this country are not paid enough. 
and the lack of secure jobs has all kinds of ramifications as we've um, as we've seen throughout the, the crisis. We need higher pay and better contracts. There's a brilliant bill going through the House of Lords from uh, John Henley, QC, which would grant all workers equal rights on day one of the job. Um, it would do a lot to address these problems in the labour market that we see, but it won't pass. But we do need to have this kind of bill because the labour movement needs to be very clear about what our demands are. Um, I think there's a lot of confusion when it comes to the different trends that we're seeing in our economy. Um, in responses from the left. So to take a recent example, um, there's been uh, an amusing kind of sideline of uh, Tim Martin and the, the head of Weatherspoons, who was one of the biggest uh, advocates of Brexit and has now found that he's got a shortage of uh, foreign waitresses and, and barmaids who he can pay uh, poverty wages. So he's complaining about um, a lack of foreign staff. But most of the response to this has been to say, oh, well, you know, you created your Brexit mess and now you're, you're reaping the consequences. Whereas what we should be saying as a Labour movement is, why is your pay so low that people that you can't hire, you know, British staff? Why have you got an economy that is dependent on super exploited foreign workers coming in? Um, immigrants don't cause, uh, you know, immigrants don't drive down pay. That's always been the right wing's myth about it. It's weak labour laws and scrupulous employers but an economy that's based on forced super exploitation of people coming in. So it is the case that we should be saying, well, if there are problems in a shortage of labor in certain industries, that is the case for unions to be pushing for higher pay. And that's how we can start to uh, build back uh, the strength of the labor movement. This has already been happening over the pandemic. That's why the trade union movement is growing. As Unite points out in today's Morning Star, that's also the case in the agricultural sector where people are complaining that they can't get staff to pick fruit. It's because the paying conditions are too bad. It's because the, um, the infrastructure isn't there for people to be working in agriculture in this country. And those are the problems that we need to fix. Now, John, who I think is on this uh, panel as well, um, he says he's not depressed about the state of the left. I've heard him say that at a number of meetings, that we have the solutions to the problems that the uh, pandemic has exposed. I think that's absolutely right in that uh, many of the policies that the Corbyn movement put forward um, are directly relevant to these issues of massive job insecurity, massive poverty, and, and uh, privatised public services that have been exposed in the pandemic. Peter Mandelson has said that this is a very arrogant attitude by the left. We, we're waiting for the public to catch up with us. But as Sean mentioned in the introduction, actually we know from repeated polls that the public are on our side on a lot of this stuff. The public do support public ownership. They do support higher pay. The CWU did polling and ahead of the Hartlepool election, which was a disaster for the Labour Party. But we found that actually people in Hartlepool were in favour of renationalising Royal Mail. They were in favour of a, a higher pay rise for the NHS and all of these policies that we would associate with the left. So if Labour's not getting those votes, it's not because people aren't supportive of the policies, it's because people don't think that the Labour Party is going to deliver them. I do think that is a major problem for us as a left. The Conservatives are politically dominant in this country. We saw how dominant they were in England in the, the, the elections last month. So um, we can point to reasons for that as being linked to a ridiculously biased media. This is my moment to give a shout out to the Morning Star. Um, we do need to support an independent anti-capitalist and socialist media because um, there is a, an institutional, huge institutional bias against socialist politics in the press. But we can't claim that nobody knows what's going on. We can't claim that nobody is exposed to the idea that the government has been reckless, incompetent, murderous over the course of the pandemic. The Dominic Cummings testimony was absolutely devastating in Parliament and it got wall-to-wall -wall coverage on the, on the TV and, and in papers. He said, you know, tens of thousands of people died who didn't need to die and that was brandished all over the front pages of, of the mainstream press. So, but it didn't affect Tory polling at all. Um, I would argue the reason for that is that the disillusionment we're seeing, the anger we're seeing, isn't finding a political outlet at the moment because there isn't a political movement that's seen as challenging what's going wrong. Political lying has become so established since the Iraq war, a minister no longer even resign when they're caught lying to parliament, that further examples of lying from, from politicians doesn't really impress the public. It doesn't turn them against one party or another because they see it as associated with the whole of the Westminster system. The only way to surmount that is to address the lack of confidence with um, a real challenge to the political system itself. And I think that in the relatively recent past, we did do that fairly successfully. I think we can't stop talking about the 
2014 election. I know that we didn't win that election. I know that the, the Corbyn movement has sort of come to an end in that sense. But it was actually a really interesting election in all kinds of ways, both because it mobilised a huge number of people to have conversations with their friends and neighbours and workmates about what change could mean. And that cut through the kind of massive institutional power of the, the capitalist press to a great extent. But also, if we look at where the Labour vote was rising in that election, it was all over the country. It was in Labour strongholds. It was in Tory strongholds. That's why you won places like Canterbury, while also massively increasing Labour majorities in places like Hartlepool. So we, we have actually, we can't try to throw away this model and say that Corbynism didn't work. <coughs> Sorry. We need to actually build on that, look at how successful we almost were at that point, build on what did work, and obviously um, try to uh, learn the lessons to what doesn't work as well. The British government is not popular. The British government is just more popular than the opposition. And as we saw in Hartlepool, voting patterns don't reflect what people say they want economically. So I think that we need to actually start winning people over to the idea of real change. And that happens by building a movement from the bottom up. We set out from where we are. We acknowledge that we keep losing elections, but we have to try and engage and persuade people on a local level. That means building the trade union movement, building campaigns like the People's Assembly, fighting over local issues of jobs, public services, um, not guilt tripping or lecturing people or kind of mocking people for voting Tory, as you see quite a lot on social media. That's not going to persuade anyone, but engaging and persuading and um, doing it from the grassroots. I think that is the way to build a movement. I think we did it very recently. I think we can do it again. So um, that's how we take on Tory class warfare and start to build an economy for the people. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. That was a really, really good overview to kick us off. And I think the point as well about the 2017 coalition is really, really well made. Um, I'm just going to flag up that we've got uh, hundreds of people joining us this rather lovely sunny morning where I am uh, from all across the country um, and across all the different streams. So here in Zoom, um, but also on YouTube, on Facebook and other social media um, streams. And we've got people joining us from Hemsworth, Tottenham, uh, Hull, Broxbourne, Preston, Leicester, uh, Cumbran, Wiltshire, Streatham, uh, Camden, Chesterfield and Sheffield. So hello to all of you uh, all across the country. Um, I'm going to turn very quickly now to our second speaker, um, who is Holly Turner, an NHS worker and from NHS Workers Say No, who have done so much to organise hundreds of thousands of people to support a 15% pay rise for NHS staff that they definitely deserve. So Holly, take it away. Thank you, Sean. Um, yeah, and it's great to be here today at this really important event. And as Sean said, my name's Holly. And I guess firstly, I'm an NHS nurse and I work in child and adolescent mental health services and have done for quite a long time. And we are facing a very, very difficult very difficult period at the moment um, in terms of the referrals we're coming in. What we're facing, I'd like to say on the back of the pandemic, but I think actually we're still in the grips of the pandemic. So we're in a very difficult time at the moment. And last summer, I, um, with a couple of other female nurses, founded the grassroots NHS pay campaign, NHS Workers Say No, as Shah mentioned. And our campaign was born last summer late July 2020 and it was born at a time when we were completely exhausted and morale was on the floor as it has been for us for a very long time and we were amid, amidst the fight against the global pandemic obviously and in the midst of that we were coping with ourselves and our colleagues becoming sick and our patients dependence on us increasing all the time and our campaign also came at a time when we were hitting the like frankly unbelievable and terrifying figure of 100,000 vacancies across the NHS and studies report that that figure is due to rise to 250,000 by 2030 which uh, that's just simply terrifying for all of us that that isn't just terrifying for the staff that that it needs to be a fear and a worry for all of us in our communities. So these figures, I don't think they come as any surprise, really, when under Tory austerity, the average NHS worker has had their pay cut by up to a fifth 
in real terms because our wages just haven't kept pace with the rate of inflation. And as a woman working in the public sector, I do want to make the point of highlighting that this government's policy on NHS pay does disproportionately affect women as we make up 80% of the workforce in the NHS. So here we've got yet another Tory policy which is hitting the standards of women workers hardest. And the exploitation of women is very clear within the NHS. We have been gender stereotyped within our jobs with the narrative that we're doing our jobs because we care. And in turn, I think that the narrative is fed that demanding a restorative pay increase after a decade of cuts to our page up cuts to our pay is in some way greedy and as a campaign we do not accept this and we are encouraging none of our colleagues to accept this we don't need to accept one percent any more than we don't need to accept our colleagues using food banks and buying ppe from Screwfix and ebay so the facts within the nhs are very clear and i think a lot of us will be well aware of them but i'll highlight a few we have experienced a decade of underfunding, actually more. We know the NHS budget has not been protected. So there have been repeated and brutal cuts to our services. There is, as I mentioned, a crisis in recruitment. And due to that, half of all the staff within the NHS report that the current situation actually stops them doing their jobs properly. So our patient care is compromised. We've got less beds per capita than any comparable country and cuts to social care services have really added a huge pressure to our NHS because there's simply not enough services available to support vulnerable people in our communities. And also we know we've got the big private companies like Virgin Care continuing to win these big contracts to run struggling NHS services for profit. And you think of these big companies taking over our struggling services and I think that suits the government quite nicely doesn't it and they want us to fail they want to be able to sell off to the highest bidder and we can't let them get away with their creeping plan of privatisation and as Ben actually mentioned previously the vaccination programme is proof that when the NHS has the resources it needs it actually delivers incredible results. And now we really need to be forcing this government to invest in all services. And as I said, I'm an NHS nurse and I've worked in the NHS for about 15 years. Um, so I've witnessed firsthand the impact that year on year of underfunding has had. And now we've had an unprecedented pandemic, which has created more serious issues. And we're going to require a comprehensive plan for us to find our way out of that. There are over reports out this week highlighted there's over five, 5 million people sitting on waiting lists. And like, how can we even begin to tackle that? So we've got a situation where we have unimaginable waiting lists. We're also facing a time where demand for our NHS services continues to rise, and that's for various reasons. But due to, amongst other things, there's population changes and more patients living with chronic and multiple illnesses. And we add this to the knock on impact of those deep cuts in social care budgets that I mentioned, and we're really faced with a crisis. And sadly, this is a crisis which has been predicted for many years and has just been completely ignored. So as workers, we've been the ones that have been left trying to plug this recruitment crisis whilst we're not being paid properly. And whilst we continue to be given our role and continue to do that, we were ignored yet again regarding our pay last year. And now this government has essentially added insult to already severe injury and delayed our pay anniversary, which was due to be in May. And but why have they done this? And we need to be asking that question and we need to be demanding answers because this isn't just about the NHS staff. We all need to be taking this situation very, very seriously because if we don't force change, the NHS is going to become increasingly dangerous. And this is about safety and this is about our standards. And we will not allow this government to abuse the goodwill of staff to deal with this staffing deficit we're struggling with because the investment in staff is about it's about patient safety and it's also about the health of our workforce so this is why nhs workers say no with support of our trade unions are fighting as sean mentioned for a 15 percent restorative pay increase for all nhs workers 
And that is so that we can try to begin to address this staff deficit and ensure that we can keep our, not just our patients, but each other safe. And it's not, I'm a nurse, but it's not just about our nurses. It's about everyone across the NHS. And that includes our porters, our domestics, our support workers, our catering staff, you know, I couldn't even list how many different and varied jobs there are in the NHS, because ensuring that all of our colleagues on Agenda for Change are paid fairly is really critical to the running of the NHS, because it, you know, it wouldn't function without every single one of them. Every single person in the service is extremely valuable. So basically, it's time that our government begins to respect our people and pay them fairly because there's no absolutely no justification for our skilled and experienced workforce to be frequently working 40 plus hours a week and taking on second jobs just to end, make ends meet. This is completely wrong. And we know that this isn't about resources. There have been many studies and they've proven that the government would actually recover at least 80% of the cost of a substantial pay increase because the Treasury would receive more in taxes, staff would spend more to actually boost the economy. So the figures we have actually speak for themselves and the real cost of paying us fairly would deliver huge benefits to the NHS also in terms of the need for recruitment and also savings on retention when we're at a point when one in three nurses want to quit. For me, we've seen that COVID has essentially been a real landmark moment within our NHS and we've seen what's happened when we don't invest in our frontline workers and when we don't organise to get the things that we need. This government has shown that they're profiteering from the pandemic, whilst our frontline workers have risked their lives daily to care for the public. And this is why we're, we're fighting for a pay increase. Um, we need to get us back to safety. And I do believe that we can win, but I believe that we all need to be united in fighting for that together. And I think that when we unite, we can achieve incredible things. We, you know, we created the NHS, the welfare state, and we, we need to fight for those things and we need to preserve them and save them so that we can build a society that people want to live in, that can give people hope um, for the future. And we can do that when we stick together across all groups. And that isn't just nurses. And I'm speaking from our NHS pay campaign, but that isn't just about us. It's about our teachers, firemen, our refuse collectors, the people who keep our schools functioning, the people who keep our children safe the people who stock our supermarkets and and that's when we can achieve the kind of society we want so I just want to say finally if you're a nurse or a healthcare worker or an ally of our profession then please please support us in our fight because now we are seeing workers all across the UK becoming organized they're building within their unions union membership is growing as we know and we're increasing the pressure in fighting for what we're owed and we're united in that and we're going to continue. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Holly. And um, I really would encourage everyone um, watching to follow uh, the campaign and to sign up to their petition. And those of you um, watching on Zoom and YouTube, the links to the campaign and the petition are in the chat. So you can just click on it while, you're, while you continue listening. Um, I'm going to turn now to our next speaker of today's session, um, who is John Trickett MP, who's a, a great friend of Arise and a really strong socialist voice in Parliament. Uh, so over to you, John. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry about that. Oh dear, you were unmuting me as I was muting myself. Oh dear, never mind. Technology. OK, well, look, uh, I think that the last speaker really uh, set up the argument I want to make very helpfully. So thank you, Holly, um, from all of us. This is not just about uh, you as a carer. It's about you as a worker fighting for justice in a system which doesn't deliver justice to working class people anywhere, does it? So look, I want to speak about the NHS, too. And I want to develop an arg the big argument. Is, so hopefully I've got time. You won't shut me off too quickly. And so, first of all, let's just remember that the NHS represents a completely different ethos to the one which the Tories are trying to create. 
the NHS puts people first and is not really, ought not to be anyway, ought not to be interested in profit. It's not the size of your wallet or your Amex card or your credit card or your insurance policy, which decides where you are in the queue for health treatment. It's the severity of your illness. That's the first point which the Tories hate because they want a, the wealthy to be able to buy <coughs> advancement. And secondly, the NHS <coughs> was never built to uh, be made uh, in such a way that you can make profit from it. And this idea of people making profit from other people's sickness is something which I think revolts the majority of people in our country. But the Tories hate it. But I think that it's very difficult for them to attack it full frontally because the NHS is something which is very precious to all, all of us. But we must remember, <coughs> excuse me, that the NHS was opposed from the beginning by the Tories. Don't forget, they voted against the establishment of the NHS 22 separate times. And there were Tory MPs in Parliament, and this is hard to believe, but it's true, who even compared the idea that the NHS should come into existence as a form of Nazism. They said that the Labour government at that time was introducing a Nazi policy when they introduced the NHS. <coughs> it's extraordinary, but it's true. Now, look, I want to tell a couple of stories because I think it's a good way to bring over the message to people who may not be interested in um, ideas. But I'm afraid I'm coughing, so I wonder if you can just pause it a minute <coughs> while I go get a glass of water. Not a problem. Um, <coughs> what? Uh, well, what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to go over to Ben Hayes, who is from Arise um, and he's an Arise volunteer. Um, so we were going to take him for a quick plug at the end of um, John, but we'll take him now uh, while John gets a glass of water. Um, so if I can invite Ben Hayes to come in and say a little bit about Arise. Well, uh, I feel like Cliff Richard at Wimbledon. Eh? Uh, hopefully you'll be able to save him. In, in, in the meantime, I'll sort of speak as a, a disembodied voice. Uh, here we go. Here I am. Uh, thanks very much, John. Uh, yeah, so my name's Ben. I'm here from uh, sunny Islington just to say uh, a little bit about Arise, uh, introduction to anyone who's unfamiliar with us. Uh, so Arise was set up a few years ago as a festival of people-powered politics. Discussion ideas on the Labour left helped bring about change for the better. We had uh, weekend-long festivals with all sorts of uh, different workshops on uh, building industrial solidarity, community campaigns, internationalism, liberation equalities issues, party democracy, labour movement history and uh, various other things. And the last couple of years, obviously adapting to the circumstances we found ourselves in, we've run sessions like this online, uh, which allows us to reach out to people across the country and indeed some other countries too. Um, if you want to keep up with future events and sessions from Arise, please do check us out on social media. You can find us on Arise underscore festival on Twitter. Uh, we're on Facebook as Arise, a festival of Labour's left ideas. And you can also follow us on YouTube. Where you can obviously uh, also watch a load of the sessions we've been hosting over the last 15 months or so. Now, while we're obviously not uh, having to book physical venues lately, we do have to meet the cost of things like using Zoom webinar for these events. And uh, I suspect we may be waiting a long time for major donors. So there'll be links posted in the chat for people to donate to Arise if you're able to contribute anything. All support is uh, greatly appreciated by us. Uh, just a couple more things. I'd recommend people check out another one of our media partners, which is in the esteemed company of the publication edited by my fellow Ben, and that's Labour Outlook, uh, which is our sister publication aimed at providing news, views, updates and ideas from across the Labour left. You can check out the website at labouroutlook.org, obviously on social media too. In the last few weeks alone, we've had pieces from John and the other campaign group MPs, articles on housing campaigns, various international issues. Um, so it's a great resource. Please do check that out. And in terms of little action points, there'll be links in the chat to petition with book going opposing cuts to universal credit and also supporting the people's plan to deal with the, legacy, the issues highlighted by the pandemic and which picked up a lot of backing from across the movement. So please do sign those. Uh, that's it from me. Please do stay uh, tuned in for what I think will be a really great discussion and have a lovely weekend. 
Thank you, Ben, uh, for jumping in there. And what I'm actually going to do is uh, we've had some questions come in. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to read out. So we've had questions for each of our speakers. I'm going to read out the questions for Holly and for Ben, Shako, uh, and not let you answer them yet. So you have some time to kind of collect your thoughts uh, while uh, John Trickett finishes his presentation and then we'll come back and do answers uh, after John Trickett's finished speaking. So uh, Holly, for you, the question from Veronica on Zoom is, when NHS service quality goes down, people blame the NHS. We need a campaign to educate the population. And linked to this is a question on Zoom from Lisa saying, are the Tories underpaying the nurses because um, they want them to leave and they want the NHS to fail as a public institution. So they say the public institutions don't work and they have to privatise it. And I think you did touch on this in your presentation. So I don't know if you want to expand on that in any way. Um, ben Shako, the question for you from Paul on Zoom is um, a question for Ben, re wages decreasing. I've been hearing the country a lot recently, i.e. the average wages are increasing, um, which will gradually drive up inflation. Could Ben or others address what is going on with this argument? Does it apply to uh, apply more to certain or better paid sectors or is it like a short term thing? Um, and or is it just another distorting effect of the widening of wealth distribution between a tiny super wealthy minority versus the poverty stricken majority? So that's like a lesson in economics uh, <laughs> from you, Ben, but uh, if you could pick up a few points on that, that'd be great. Um, and I think we are ready to go back to John now. So John. Sorry about that, everybody. I think it's um, Haiti. There's a lot of pollen around, as we all know. Anyway, here we go. So, look, I was, first of all, setting up the, the argument about the NHS. The Tories hate it for reasons which I've given. Uh, they fought it every way they could, but it was being established, as I described. It's extraordinary to think that it could be described as a form of Nazism. Um, <clears throat> and I wanted just to tell you two quick stories, which I think illustrate a lot about what's happening in our country, but also um, about the NHS, the Tories' attitude to it and why we have to fight. So the first one is an old man I met in my constituency a couple of years ago. He told me an extraordinary story. He's in his 90s. His father was a miner, as many people were in my area. Back in the 30s, <clears throat> you were paid on the amount of coal you delivered to the pit head. Him and his mate were driving a truck full of coal down the rail underground up to the pit head and rushing because you were paid so much per you know ton of coal. The wagon turned on its side and the coal spilled everywhere. Now, normally they would have called for their mates to come and help, but in fact, what they tried to do is lift it themselves to uh, in, you know to get the thing to the pit head as quickly as possible in order to get back to the coal face. <clears throat> However, <clears throat> tragically, the wagon fell back on them, killed my constituent's dad's mate, and he broke his back, uh, my constituent's father in the 30s, and he never worked again. They grew up in poverty. There was no NHS. It was a privatised form of medicine. You couldn't, uh, working class people couldn't afford the kind of operation which was needed. But later, though, in, after 48, his dad went to see the doctor and the doctor said, look, we could have saved you back. You could have got back to work. But he said they lived their whole lives in poverty. And I think that reminds us just uh, the situation that existed in our country and in, over the world where there isn't a socialised form of medicine. But that in itself is incredibly distressing, but what's very interesting was, so <clears throat> my constituents, whole family were committed to both Labour Party, to socialism and to the NHS. But it was telling me though, that across the garden was another family who were Conservative Party members. On the day that the NHS was created, which was the 5th of July, so the anniversary isn't too far away now, the neighbours, the Tory neighbours, leaned across the back fence and said, well, we're going to the doctor today. We're going to get free glasses, free teeth, free walking sticks and free anything else we can think of. 
So <clears throat> he said, well, you've got grasses, chief, and you, you know, you're quite wealthy. And what the, what the neighbour said was extraordinary. He said, well, the Tory agent has told us to go bankrupt the NHS. And all across my part of Yorkshire and possibly through the whole country, for I know, Tories were going in, it deliberately trying to destroy the NHS. Now, that is an extraordinary thing. It hasn't been recorded, it seems to me, in any literature, but we ought to know more about it because the Tories to this day continue to destroy the NHS for the reasons that I've given. Now, the second story is 70 years later, <clears throat> in just in the recent past, a woman in my constituency rings me up, will you come and see me, John? I've got a problem. So we went round to the house and she was a nurse. And what she told me was she'd worked on the theatres, the operating theatres in one of the local hospitals. And what happened is they increased the number of theatres for, for operations, but they didn't increase the number of nurses and they cut the number of ward orderlies, which meant that the nurses were now required to do more work but also moving quite heavy people from the beds where the theatre had, had the operation onto the trolleys and, and so on, back to, the, back to the wards. One day she was doing this on quite a heavy uh, guy and she felt a twink, twink in her back and thought she'd pulled a muscle. Uh, when she went to bed that night, <clears throat> she could feel a pain in her back, but she thought it would be okay the following morning. The next morning she wakes up and her torso is in a different orientation to her hips and legs and she realised she'd broken her back, caring for patients. And, you know, I find it shocking that that should be the case, but when I went to see her, she'd gone back to work, the managed to repair her back, <clears throat> and um, but she was living in poverty because she couldn't do the same work. She was working less hours and, and a less skilled job. And when I looked around the house, I could see the mark of poverty in the house. And I thought it's tragic that that should be the case. But the worst thing of all was she had two young children and she said they came, used to come home, go to the fridge as kids do, there was nothing in it to feed them. No snacks, no sandwiches, no nothing. <clears throat> the two kids had left home and gone to live with the father from whom she was estranged. And it's heartbreaking to think that that should happen. But it's not just an, an incident which just happens to just it somehow happen spontaneously. It's deliberately organized by the Tory party who want to destroy the NHS. Those two, those two stories together, linking the decades between the foundation of the NHS and the present day, linking you know, the Tory's view of how patients should be treated and then how staff should be treated I think tells us all that we really do need to know. Now, look, they're trying to squeeze the health service, as we know. £1.7 billion was cut from the NHS even during the pandemic. As we've heard, low wages for the staff. I've signed and I've launched an EDM in Parliament saying that the staff should all receive a 15% rise. Waiting lists are growing rapidly, and that is a key factor, which I want to come back to in a second. But they've also cut the number of the uh, number of A&Es and, as we know, various other aspects of the NHS have been cut. If you produce a situation, as they are doing, where waiting lists increase, where you might be in agony waiting for some operation, and you're now being told it's three or four years before the NHS can treat you, then if you can raise your money, this is the Tories calculation, if you can borrow money, speak to your relatives, or you've got a little bit of money put away in the bank, you may well be tempted to go into the private sector. And this di diabolical decision to allow the waiting list to increase isn't just an accident. It hasn't happened just because of COVID. Look, the number of people waiting for a bed is, would al almost doubled between the end of the Labour government and before the COVID started. Look at the figures for yourselves. This is not purely about COVID at all. This is a deliberate attempt to run down the NHS in an effort to drive people into the private sector. And of course, as we know, lucrative contracts worth billions of pounds are being handed over to the private uh, sector in one form or another. 
And I don't know whether this is a fact that everybody's aware of, but we need to get it out there. Every single major private sector health firm in our country has failed a CQC inspection on at least one of their sites. This is not as if the private sector was somehow a Rolls Royce opposed to something else in the NHS. They are fattening the private sector up. They're doing it by driving staff out. The staff vacancies are now enormous. By cutting the services, by increasing the waiting list, all of this is part of a kind of a class war uh, waged by the rich, in this case by private health service providers, many of whom donate money to the Tories or actually have got MPs or members of the House of Lords who would take the Tory whip working for the private sector. This is a war against the NHS. We have to fight it. And I, I place my support fully to the staff who want to fight this in whatever way they feel is necessary. And let's remind ourselves finally, finally what by Nye Bevan's famous quote, when he said, there will always be a national health service providing that there are people in our country prepared to fight for it. Well, now is the time, comrades. Let's make sure we get behind both the patients and the workforce in trying to develop a top class NHS still in place for generations to come. And, and apologies for my coughing at the beginning, by the way. No, thank you so much for, for battling on, uh, John. And I think actually that was a really like powerful ending um, that will like also link, I think, really well back into like Holly's um, comments when we come to her and sort of like her further comments to the question that I read out. Um, before I go to Holly and Ben uh, for sort of their comments after the questions I read out, I just want to read out a question for you, John, if that's all right, and I'll come back to you after Holly and Ben have spoken. Um, and I think actually this is like a really important one. Um, one slogan that uh, that we hear on the left a lot and that we raise a lot in society is that we need to see a fundamental shift of not only wealth in our economy but power too from the many to um from the we need to shift uh power from the few to the many yeah. what does <laughs> it's like written down but i think i know what they mean uh what does that actually look like? What does a redistribution of power in our economy and society look like? And what does it mean to argue for more power in our economy for um, working people? So I think that's actually quite, uh, you know, an important, a good one for you to, to come back on. Um, I'm just going to come back to Holly, first of all, though, uh, to answer the question I put to her earlier. Holly. Thanks, John. Um, well, the first question about are the Tories underpaying us because they want um, us to leave in the NHS to fail? I think John really answered that quite well in his speech. Um, and I think what he touched on about people, you know, raising money and using private services, they are doing that. I've got friends that have done that and I've got friends that have done that by accessing private health care by their partner or by their employer's insurance because they are sat on these astronomical waiting lists I know in our mental health services there's up to a 24 month wait for psychological therapies if if you're in crisis you're not going to be able to wait two years to speak to somebody about what you're struggling with so yeah people are accessing um private health care um and I think there's also that that narrative that I spoke about that the government repeatedly say that it's a vocation and it's because we care. And I think they try and rely on that a little bit that we won't stand up, we won't be loud because we've got our nursing code of practice and ultimately that we won't go on strike. But I think that we, we will strike if that's what we need to do to achieve patient safety. We will we will do that. And I think the government needs to stop stop relying on that. Um, in regard to the campaign to educate the population, I would say that's why we made NHS workers say no, so that we could get out there and spread the message. We wanted more people to get active in their trade unions so that we could push them um, to support in us in our pay asks and ultimately perhaps balloting for strike or balloting on pay and getting those high turnouts. I've got colleagues today um, 
And along with another important bit for us in educating the population is forming allies. And we've been doing a lot of that as NHS workers say no. And there's a stall today right now on the high street where I live, which has got people across all different groups and NHS workers. And we're trying to hand out everything, you know, posters, badges, anything that we can spread our message and leaflets, especially around we're having nationwide protests on the 3rd of July to mark the NHS anniversary with with some allies and yeah that that's a very important part because I know that some of what I spoke about today a lot of people will know but a lot of people don't know that stuff and it is getting the message out there. Thank you so much Holly um, and Ben do you want to come in and back on the points that were put to you? Oh thanks Sean yeah no that's a really interesting point actually about what's happening um, in Britain in terms of wages at the moment. I think we're actually at quite an unusual point and we're gonna, um, there are two ways we could go on this and a lot depends on how the labor movement actually reacts. What we've got on the one hand is mass unemployment caused by COVID um, and the repeated lockdowns and so on. <coughs> in some, some ways it skewed the, the wages sector because shutdowns of, of sectors like hospitality where you've got very low paid workforces in general. Um, if those people are out of work, then man, it can look like the average pay is going up if lots of people who are on minimum wage are out of work. That's part of what's creating the, the picture that we have here. Um, but we've got the, the whole um, exploitation of this mass unemployment by companies with fire and rehire, which we saw with the British gas engineers and in, in many other com companies where there are deliberate attempts to say, look, um, our company has suffered because of the pandemic. Therefore, we are going to renegotiate all of your contracts and you're going to be paid less. That's happening in lots and lots of sectors. So, so pay is being driven down. And of course, we've just been talking about NHS pay. The 1% award in the public sector, 1% um, award from the government is a real terms pay, um, pay cut for people, following on from years of pay cuts for people. So very large sector of the economy we are seeing, the pressure is for downward wages for all the reasons that Holly and John have talked about and, and also possibly because of the privatisation agenda in, in the NHS means that you know it's, you're not going to attract contractors if people are on good wages uh, um, they want um, they want a low paid workforce for that reason as well but at the same time we're seeing that the shortages of labour in certain areas are leading to pressure for wages to rise and that's true to an extent in hospitality now it's been beginning to open up again. It's definitely true in the agricultural sector. Um, that is something which unions need to be fighting on. The reason I think this is potentially a temporary situation is because, of course, the furlough schemes and so on haven't ended yet. I've had conversations with sort of pub landlords and people who were saying, oh, well, when people are on furlough, we can't get them to apply for these kind of jobs. Um, the actual reason, of course, is because pay is so low across the entire sector. I'm not blaming individual pub landlords for that. Some of them will be again, up against it themselves. But the, um, the trade union movement needs to make sure that the answer to these areas where people are saying, well, um, we can't get the staff anymore, is to say, well, you're not paying enough money and we need to push for, for higher wages. So I think as we come out of the pandemic in the autumn, it's a real crunch point for trade unions. Are we going to be able to organise for higher pay in these sectors. And when it comes to the public sector, that's a massive political organization that needs to be behind it. I mean, <coughs> NHS I know, is a brilliant um, example of this, but the NHS is one of those um, iconic sectors where we can get, as we saw um, in the Hartlepool polling by CWU, there is mass support for higher pay for nurses. We need to make it politically costly for the Tories not to give in on this. They've got all kinds of motives for keeping pay low but we need to make the cost of it too high for them and that I think means putting pressure on MPs and local governments in all kinds of ways so that there is a campaign for higher pay in all parts of the country. As I said in my original contribution I do think pay needs to be absolutely front and centre of what the, the Labour movement is talking about because it's a huge and long-term problem that wages have been in decline in this country. We're seeing a very small rise in a very few sectors at the moment and that's creating panic in, in capitalist media and so on when they're talking about the dangers of inflation. They never talk about the dangers of inflation when house prices are going up or when profits are going up. It's only when wages are going up that they start to panic. So I think we need, it's a job for us to make sure that wages do start to go up. 
Thank you, Ben. Um, and uh, John, I'm going to come to you now. So am I going to ask the question, answer the question about power? That's, I think I should talk about that, if that's OK with you, Sharon. Yeah. So, look, I think let me just start with somewhere different slightly. The first thing is, um, and I've used these figures before at Arise um, meetings, but it's worth just reminding ourselves that since the banking crash, the um, income of, if there are 33 million people roughly who work for a living in our country, they have lost round about, I think it's uh, over 400 billion pounds in incomes, wages and salaries. At the same time, uh, as we know, we follow the Sunday Times list carefully, not because we're jealous of billionaires, but because we're interested in what it tells us about the way our country runs. So 450 billion roughly lost by working people and over 500 billion pounds in increased wealth by the richest thousand people in our country, an almost direct transfer of, from incomes into the wealth of the richest thousand people. So it's 33 million on the one hand, 1,000 on the other. That is a very striking direct transfer. But here's something interesting, which I've not spelled out before on on a, a rise, which is on the one hand, workers are losing income, but on the other hand, the richest people are gaining wealth. And we need to understand that. Now, it raises a second point. I'm gonna to come to the question of power in a minute, but I want there's an argument that we need to understand carefully, which has been lost by socialists in the last few decades. And it's this, that wealth is not taxed in our country, whereas income is. It's only taxed by capital gains if you sell the assets which you own. Now, that's an interesting fact. And why is it that wealth increases in wealth are not taxed? And another thing is unearned income is not taxed at the same level as earned income. And here's the thing, if you earn uh, dividends from the, the shares which you own, you could have tens of millions of shares. You don't, uh, you don't pay the same level of tax as you do if you're earn, earning money. Now, why should an unearned income be paying less tax than earned income? Why should wealth, which is now extraordinary in our country, the billionaires, not really be taxed uh, by the increases in wealth? Because where does power actually lie in the economic sphere of our country? It lies by the people who own capital, the people who own wealth. And it's the reason why incomes are falling is because the people who own capital are driving down wages. Why are they driving down wages? Because it means that they increase the value, the rate of profit, and therefore the value of the capital which they own. There ought to be an attack by taxation on the richest, on their wealth, not simply their income. An unearned income should be taxed at least at the same level as earned income, and it isn't. Now, it's a, it's a mystery to me why the left doesn't want to tackle capital by taxation and by other means too, because that is where power lies in our country. The ability to close a factory like that or to open up a nursing home to make profits or to transfer you know, work from one part of the world to another where labor is cheaper. This is real power, which these people, the, the capitalists, the ruling class have. And I think, so when, I, when people say to me, yeah, transfer, um, a transfer of power, wealth and power in our country, power is located first of all with the people who own wealth, but yeah, we haven't really made the argument, though I've begun, and I think others too, a little bit, to talk about a wealth tax. So I'm not quite sure that is totally the answer, but I am going to spend a lot of time talking about wealth in the coming months. But then the second thing is political power. Political power, um, theoretically, in a democracy, rests in the Houses of Parliament. And I've been a member for nearly, MP for nearly 26 years, but... When you analyze carefully what is happening with our political structures, 
they're dominated by corporate interests. It's the lobbyists, it's the money men and women, you know, it's the people with um, vested interests who dominate so much of the decision making. And an example is private medicine, where private medicine rooted in America is increasingly moving into the political structures of our country because they sense a massive opportunity to uh, you know, make money from sick people in Great Britain. It's an untapped market from their point of view. Now, I think, so when I want to see, talk about transfer of power, I want to see power um, taken out of the hands of big money. And that means quite a radical political revolution if we're going to uh, make democracy and politics work for us. And it means taking money out of politics, including out of the labor movement, because money does get into the labor movement too, as well as into the, the Tories of the political wing of the ruling class. We know that. But still, that is what needs to be happened. Now, how we do that, that change in the political structure, the political revolution, the two labor manifestos, the parts of the two labor manifestos, 2017, 2019, I wrote the bits on the political revolution. It's worth going back and having a quick look but again, I don't think we've made enough of it because people don't trust politics in our country. And if you're going to reestablish the belief in hope that a world, a better world can be created, you need to uh, encourage people to believe in politics. But they don't believe in politics as it is now, and rightly so. So sorry to go on a bit, but this is a crucial question which the left needs to address if we're going to move forward and you know carry our revolution through to its logical end which is a country which works for the many and not simply for the few no i think that's a really really important point and i think it also like really links back to one of the points ben made earlier which is one of the real positive and amazing things in that 2017 general election was how if you walked into like a calf or you were stood at like the bus stop, people were like talking about politics and were engaged with it in a really like positive, non-cynical way. They really felt that there was a potential for change and something positive could come from it. And I think really kind of like, um, and I think it's really important that that was, that was about not doing politics in the same way and not the status quo so i think that's a really important point to make um we've got um sort of 10 or 10 more minutes really of this session so what i'd like to do is one of the i think all of you sort of touched on this tangentially but i think it's worth spelling out explicitly because i think um it's like one of the questions that's coming so i'm just gonna pop this last question in your heads um and i'm also gonna ask you for any like final concluding remarks for this session um things you want to highlight or draw out and um, we'll come back on what uh, any of the other speakers have said um but the question is, um, some people point to the billions spent on furlough um, by this government and other measures during the COVID crisis and say the Tories have ended austerity. Um, how do we rebut that? I think that's a really important point because I think um, the government are successfully using the confusion around they've spent lots of money to say they've ended cuts and austerity. Um, so uh, any thoughts on that and any final concluding remarks each of you would like to make? I'm going to come to um, Ben first, if that's okay. Yeah. Um, let's... <laughs> there's, there's um, quite a lot of uh, broad sort of topics that we've been um, covering and it's hard to, to, to sum it up. Um, I think that what we need to do is actually, as I kind of finished my, my talk on, is, the, is that focus on winning local level fights, um, actually building up a movement that has a local kind of presence. I think that we've been uh, beaten as a left on an institutional level. Um, we've been beaten at the general election, although not nearly as badly as the media would tend to present it. You know, there, there's all this kind of talk of like the worst election result in, um, you know, since the 1930s. And it's not, um, you know, it, it's, it's true if you look at the result in one particular way in terms of the, the number of seats and so on, but it's not true in terms of number of votes. It's not true in all kinds of other um, ways, in, ways in which you can measure the Labour result. 
So we've got this kind of contradiction where we built up a really large left, militant left in, in the kind of Labour Party. I think it got, um, it got various things wrong and got confused in various ways. But what is presented as a kind of irrevocable defeat for that left in the mainstream media and, and across uh, official Westminster politics is actually nothing like as um, conclusive as that. Um, that. There's actually still a huge left which um, at the moment isn't particularly hopeful because of all of the, the terrible things that are happening but there's a huge number of people who've woken up to the unsustainability of our system um, the g7 again as i started on the g7 it's happening in cornwall you listen to these people and they talk as if they have solutions to all of the massive problems that we're facing but um actually sorry But actually what we've seen, and more and more people understand this, is that the problems are rooted in the entire economic system, that we can't solve climate change unless we really um, address the underlying problems in the capitalist system, that we can't um, actually address power and wealth, um, address you know uh, questions like poverty and so on without addressing these crucial questions of power and wealth that John Trickett has been uh, talking about. So actually I think one lesson that we need to come out, come out of this uh, session is, is that events like this are important because we need to regain that attitude that we had in that period of 2015 onwards that we can change things and that hope is as important as, as getting angry at the system and that um, we rebuild that trust in politics that John mentioned by actually organizing and engaging with people locally. I think there have been some really good examples of that over the last few months. I think that the kill the bill demonstrations and, and the Palestine solidarity demonstrations as well. These were not set piece events in London. They were quite spontaneous. It took place everywhere. They took place in small towns as well as big cities. And actually you get people who have no particular political outlook. And in fact, you even get people who voted Tory and things coming along and saying, oh, well, what's this demonstration about? And talking to people at that local level. So I think that's how we rebuild um, the left as a kind of fighting, uh, fighting force. Thanks, Charles. Thank you, Ben. Um, I'm going to come to Holly next. If there's any last thoughts or comments you would like to make. Yeah, thank you. I'll give a brief comment because I know we're nearly out of time. Um, but just in response to what you were saying, especially in regards to furlough, um, that I think the vulnerability of our workers, especially frontline workers, has been really, really clear throughout the pandemic. Um, so what a final message that I would give to people is join a trade union. And it was the trade unions that were instrumental in putting that pressure on the government to save jobs um, and trade union pressure is the only reason that we have furlough and it's obviously not a narrative that the government would promote because they don't want people to join unions do they so um so yeah that's the message that i would give across to people in regard to that thank you holly um and john final comment okay. thanks much well very briefly um look i've lived i've lived a long time in political activism I first, uh, I think I was first active in the Vietnam War, that's right, the 1960s. But I've seen, therefore, times when we've felt as though we were defeated. And what happened is people didn't stop being active, but quite often they went into what we used to call single issue campaigns, you know, whether uh, one issue or another. All those single issue campaigns, you know, whether it's though it's not really a single issue if you think about it, the fight against nuclear weapons or whatever it might be, all were very important. And, you know, I wouldn't in any way say that that was a mistake. However, something binds all of those single issues together, and that is, uh, I suppose, an analysis of the way our society works, how power is located uh, with a ruling class which exercises economic power as I've described earlier and most of the different issues which face us whether it's the environment or whatever it may be are rooted back in the central uh, problem which we've described and which most socialists fully understand so here's the thing <clears throat> we've gone through what felt like a defeat but we showed there were hundreds of thousands of people who had come to the conclusion that you cannot go on 
in the same old way anymore. Now, my fear is that people will either lapse into a kind of quietism, sort of apathy and so on, or else into single issues. And I don't want to discourage people doing single issues, as I've just said, they're really important. But the real thing is, is to retain the vision and to remember 2017. Because whatever you thought about the problems with the second referendum after 2017 and the 29 result, 2017, though we didn't win the election, lit a torch that sent a light across the whole planet. And I know that because people from all over the country who have encountered, all over the world who have encountered in the last 40 or 50 years of activism were contacting me, you know, from France, Italy, Spain or wherever. This is amazing. This is absolutely amazing. We lit a torch. We lit a torch. We set a flame going, which illuminated parts of the way in which the planet works. And we must never forget that, you know, well over 10 million people voted for us on two separate occasions in 2017. Okay, we didn't win. And okay, what then happened afterwards has been tough for all of us, the exclusion of Jeremy from the Labour Party, but not from the Labour movement, by the way, he's still there. And so those people are there. A significant part of the British population responded to our message. And that gives me hope. It gives me hope for the future that the defeat which we've suffered this time is not going to result in the impact which it had the last time we were defeated when Thatcher, when I was very active, when Thatcher was elected, people lapsed into all sorts of private activity. Do join a union, do get involved in various activities, but remember, we can change our society. And that is what's required if we're going to really save the future for our planet, our wonderful Mother Earth as well as humanity as well. And thanks again, as I always say, to Sean and everybody else behind the scenes for organizing today's event. Thank you so much, John. I think that was such a really, really great opening session with I think really like thoughtful comments and interesting points from all of our speakers and actually ended up co uh, covering like a huge amount of, of ground um, in a very short space of time. So I think that's been a really brilliant start to the day. Um, so thank you to all of our speakers for participating. Um, you know, I think it's really clear that on the left, uh, to win again as um, Labour really needs to be an anti-austerity party and not just be anti-austerity, but also really stand for a positive, bold economic agenda and um, that can defend and create jobs, can improve lives and living standards. Um, based on investment not cuts and really kind of build on that coalition that we saw in 2017 and really i think that also means from my point of view i think it we need to hold the government to account and to oppose all aspects of its reactionary economic agenda and we know that dangers definitely lie ahead with this government um so as well as all of us having important battles ahead um we know just how important our campaigning is to keep putting forward these socialist policies um in labor and the labor movement and in our communities and to build that united resistance and um, throughout the country as all of our speakers have mentioned um to the so all I'm going to mention before I sort of finish this last session is that for the latest on these campaigns and from organisations and people who have spoken here today, uh, both in this session and later, uh, be sure to read and follow uh, Labour Outlook, uh, sign up to the different campaign links we've put in the chat. Um, I also want to flag up, given this first session's topic, um, there is obviously the People's Assembly Against Austerity demonstration on June the 26th against the government um, and these types of protests um, in a socially distanced, responsible way are definitely important in terms of showing the strength of opposition to this government. Um, so I want to highlight all of those things uh, to you before uh, you go and take a break. Um, our next session starts at 12.30, so just uh, 15 minutes time, um, and it's gonna feature speakers from across uh, the left of Labour, and they're gonna be speaking about fight the Tories, not the left, defending Labour Party democracy and our socialist policies. Um, remember, if you're on Zoom, YouTube, and apparently there's hundreds of you on Twitter, so 
mentioning you as well. You can stay on throughout the day, just keep the link live in your device. Um, and we will just uh, go silent for 15 minutes while you all go off and make a cup of tea and a sandwich. And then we'll see you back here at half past 12. Thank you.